thank you everyone on the live stream. Um, welcome for joining our event this morning. I'm Erin Scrantz, a communications officer at the World Bank Group. And this is the inaugural event of the Prosperity Collaborative. Um, tech tax and technology during and beyond the coronavirus pandemic. We have a great panel for you today, and we're very excited to talk with everyone. But first, a few housekeeping items. If you have any questions for the panelists during the event, you can go ahead and email them to digi at newamerica.org, or you can tweet about the event um, with the hashtag Prosperity Collaborative. Uh, with that out of the way, I'd like to hand things over to Marcelo Estevao. Global Director for Macroeconomics, Trade and Investment at the World Bank Group. Over to you, Marcelo. Thank you very much, Erin. First of all, I would like to welcome everybody. This is a quite important event. Um, it really uh, is an event that marks this ongoing collaboration with key partners in this in this space. It's a great collaboration. Um, let me give let me give a. a, a, a overarching kind of view of what's happening right now and how this collaboration fits uh, um, the crisis that you're facing. I mean, the coronavirus has been spreading rapidly across the world since December 2019, and the World Health Organization declared the global pandemic on March 11th. Although countries are now far more prepared for a pandemic than in the past, the world is also far more in interconnected, making the contagion particularly dangerous. Now, it is a fact that this pandemic will result in a sudden and sharp recession for the global economy starting this year. We see the data right now, the bad data on economic growth right now. We are actually revising the global GDP growth proje projections. And we expect now a sizable drop in global GDP in the range of 3% this year. Now, it is feared that even though a good policy response can limit its duration, its effects will be felt for a long time. Thus, here we are talking about uh, a key fiscal issue that is on public revenue, how public revenue uh, is going to behave and how we can help countries to, to improve uh, revenue collection. The global re recession is actually going to cause a significant public revenue loss. Additional public spending will be necessary to manage and contain the pandemic and to mitigate the loss of incomes for vulnerable households and business, businesses. So many countries are struggling to mobilize the necessary resources for an effective fiscal response. Um, many countries have also much higher public debt that, uh, at the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic compared to the situation prior to this global, uh, to the global crisis. The number of low-income countries at an elevated risk of debt distress is also up sharply, and there is a growing international concern about the debt situation. Uh, that this means that many countries enter the COVID-19 pandemic with significantly reduced fiscal space to respond to the pursuing uh, economic crisis. So um, the World Bank is quite involved into this issue, both on the debt side and on the policy side. Indeed, last week, the World Bank Group announced that its emergency operations to fight the economic impacts of the coronavirus has reached 100 developing countries. And that's home to 7% of the world's population. This assistance is the largest and fastest crisis response in the bank group's history. And it represents a significant step in implementing our commitment to provide up to $160 billion in grants and financial support over a 15 month period. Now, in I mentioned that that issue. So, in support of the country with significant debt burden, uh, the G20 launched the debt suspension uh, initiative, the debt service suspension initiative, following calls from our bank president and the IMF managing director. So this initiative will suspend debt service payments on bilateral debt over the initial period between May and December 2020 for either countries. It could free up resources of up to $9 billion from debt service obligations to bilateral creditors alone. Discussion on the suspension of debt service payments Two commercial credits are underway, but that doesn't impinge upon the official initiative. The World Bank is providing support in the implementation of this initiative. And like I said, we also, um, we also uh, really stepping up net positive flows to those countries, uh, as the amount of loan that we give to them is larger than, much larger, uh, six times larger than the amount of 
interest and payments they are, they are paying the World Bank. Um, now, now come to, to the revenue administration response to the COVID-19 related slowdown, which is directly related to the event. While it is too early to assess the impact, revenues are expected to decline faster than GDP due to the economic slowdown. In fact, the impact on revenues will likely exceed the hit on economic growth. As the world works to manage the current crisis and the economic slowdown, several governments have announced preliminary measures in recent days and weeks, many with the support of the World Bank and our team, ranging from providing automatic rollover to, of debt to small businesses, that happens actually in developed economies like Italy and Germany, to extend unemployment insurance equivalent to nearly 100% of wages to all laid off works, like you saw in France. Uh, this is actually generally aim at assisting business individuals with cash flow, flow problems so that liquidity shortfalls do not become solvents in crisis. So we are currently in this contain containment phase. It's not the phase to support necessary big projects because of social isolation, but it's the time to contain the effects of the crisis. Many governments have undertaken a range of policy measures beyond the ones that I mentioned uh, before such as reducing tax or health-related expenditures, providing relief to vulnerable taxpayers, and cutting tax rates to promote economic activity more broadly. So administratively, deadlines for filing have been extended, installment arrangements put in place for cash-strapped taxpayers, and taxpayer services virtualized. Business continuity measures have been instituted to enable tax officials to work remotely and communications plans have been in place to ensure that taxpayers know how to file and pay taxes and receive answers to key tax queries when face-to-face -face contact is no longer possible. Again, the issue that we are going to discuss today is quite important on, on how to improve uh, non-face-to-face -face contact. Countries with a developed digital tax infrastructure have been more agile in adapting to the crisis because the systems are online and do not require phys physical presence. The IT systems enable officials to work remotely. And importantly, they have a high quality taxpayer file that provides robust data, provides robust data in a safe and secure manner to help analyze the fiscal consequences of proposed tax measures. Now, we know that advancing technology have pot the potential to transform tax systems. Successfully deployed information technology can help build trust between taxpayers and government and make taxation systems more transparent. This is because digital solutions provide the same experience to everyone who are using them, reduce discretion and make it clear to everyone what the procedures are. As we look towards this recovery phase, and there will be a recovery from this crisis, believe me, it may take a while, but there will be a recovery. Digital infrastructure will be key to driving the efficiency of tax administrations through automation and simplification. This will provide clear benefits to taxpayers in the form of lower compliance costs. Digital solutions can also be effective in expanding the tax base. Remember, a recovery time may not be the best time to raise taxes, but it may be the time to expand the tax base. And that can be, do, can be done, including by identifying and eliminating sources of pers persistent non-compliance and fraud, as well as supporting new revenue stream, which for many countries could include, for instance, property taxation. Now, this does not necessarily mean more taxes, again, but a shift in the tax base. So recognize the significant potential in this technology, uh, also as well as the bar barrier to the adoption. We in the World Bank, UI, MIT, New America, and Boston Global Forum decide to launch the Prosperity Collaborative. Its purpose is to help transform tax systems in developing countries through greater adoption of innovative technology, through capacity building and the creation of a new class of digital public goods under the motto, build once, deploy anywhere. New innovative technologies can provide material automation relief that will result in more efficient tax administration. But these innovative technology and data systems 
are importantly solving complex tax problems much more effectively, resulting in a new collective intelligence, the best of humans and machines uh, together. So we will, we will work with governments to increase transparency, but also to increase accountability around the use of tax revenue and assist public institutions that want to develop metrics and storytelling capacity to show their people how tax receipts are being directed to meet the needs of individuals and society. So the collaborative's work will focus on, first, strengthening the capacity of developing countries, and that's in particular the capacity to digitally transform the tax systems through training and knowledge sharing. Two, facilitating the development of innovative tax technologies and new standards where there is strong need for developing countries and a gap in the market. Three, promoting open source technology governance models that, are inter that can be used uh, within ex existing systems to lower implementation costs and to adhere to common standards and data models to encourage collaboration across countries. We are all building a global ecosystem of stakeholders. We form this group of stakeholders as the prosper prosperity collaborative because we believe that no single institution has the capabilities, capacity, and legitimacy to develop and implement innovative technologies on a broad scale. There are three ways to get involved in our work. Join us to build digital tech solutions and applicable standards. Work with us to deploy digital technologies in your country and help shape this work and mobilize the necessary resources. On behalf of the Prosperity Collaborative, I thank you for joining this event. Let me hand over now the baton to Chiara Bronchi, who will moderate the first panel. Chiara heads the World, Bank, World Bank's Fiscal Policy and Sustainable Growth Unit. It is uh, her and her team that have worked with the other partners to make this collaboration and event possible. So I wanna thank all of you I have to apologize, they have to move to, to, to uh, another to an official discussion now, but I'm really excited about this work and I think all of you are doing a great job. Thank you very much, everybody, and have, have a good discussion. Uh, thank you, Marcelo, um, and good luck with the next meeting. In the meantime, I want to say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who is connecting on stream. Um, and welcome to this uh, session on that will cover the new role of tax administrations in pandemic response. As Marcelo mentioned, the global pandemic has prompted many governments to call on tax administrations to take on new roles, including alleviating cash flow constraints of businesses and individuals. And in some cases, tax administrations have been uh, even asked to help in transferring cash to less advantaged citizens under this COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Administratively, many revenue authorities had to ensure that their IT system could be accessed by officials working from home, expand online services, monitor new compliance risks, and so on. Big tasks that in many cases, they have not never had to face before. All urgent demands do require also different response in addition to being immediate. And there is definitely an expectation of business continuity, despite the need to respect social distancing. This panel will focus on how tax administrations are adapting to the current crisis. And we're joined by a world-class panel that will help us better understand the evolving role of the tax administration. And uh, the questions that we want to explore is, much as possible in this one hour that we have these distinguished guests with us are five. And one is how COVID-19 is such a unique situation and how is it straining and what is type of uh, challenges it's placing on tax administration. The other one is what tools have been useful to tax administration in these circumstances? What are we learning? What challenges are tax administration facing in effectively implementing uh, related programs? Lack of tax data of target beneficiary, uh, transparency, preventing fraud, and maintaining data security and privacy in the current situation. Another question is how have tax administration remained resilient during the crisis? 
while working remotely? How do they manage HR? And then coming out of the immediate of the immediacy of the pandemic, what longer term changes will tax administration implement to improve resiliency? And I guess we don't have a crystal ball, but if we could, I want to hear from our speakers. How do they think the tax administration will reshape themselves or may change their business process? And so without further ado, let me introduce our panelists and then I'll give them the floor. And I think the rule of the game today is that I will give five minutes to each to uh, introduce themselves and also to give us the key points in, from their own perspective. And then I will ask a few questions and then I think we will open the floor for some additional questions. And so um, we have four this morning in, in this section on, our, on my panel and one is Kate Barton. Welcome, Kate. She's Thank joining you. Hi, Kate. She's joining from the Ernst & Young, and which I will say now EY to keep it short. And she is the Global Vice Chair of Tax. And as a global leader of the Ernst & Young Tax Practice, she has a purview worldwide. And she's responsible for strategy and operations, people development, risk management, and learning and innovation efforts. And so I am looking forward to hearing from you, Kate. And uh, and thank you for finding the time to stay with us today. Our second panelist is Tara Saidimu. Hi, Tara. Hi, Ken. Hi. Uh, so Dr. Saidimu is the Commissioner for Intelligence and Strategic Operations for the Kenya Revenue Authority. Prior to his current role, he served as the Deputy Commissioner of the same department where he was responsible for tax intelligence analysis, and source management. And welcome, Tierra. Our okay. third panelist is Rahul Junquera Varela. Uh, uh, Raul is uh, obviously a dear colleague of mine. And Raul is the lead economist uh, specialist um, and tax specialist at the World Bank. He has over 30 years' experience in public sector management reform. And I think his passion and love has been, at least since I've been knowing him, uh, tax administration and customs. Welcome, Raul. And uh, last but definitely not least is Sandy Pentland. Sandy is a professor at MIT and directs MIT Connection Science. This is an MIT wide initiative and previously helped create a direct the MIT Media Lab. Welcome, Sandy. And uh, Sandy is also one of the most cited computational scientists in the world. And Forbes declared him one of the seven most powerful data scientists. So we are absolutely delighted to have you and also looking forward to hearing from you, Sandy. My pleasure. Um, so in, uh, let me, let's get started and uh, let me turn to Kate. Kate, representing one of the big four uh, uh, advisory uh, and tax advisory uh, agencies, businesses in the world. Um, what are the types of challenges your clients you think they're facing at this moment? And uh, where are they seeking your help? In which area? And is there a silver lining in all of this? Well, I think companies right now are challenged with just the level of activity. I mean, first and foremost, they're very concerned about their people. And so everybody has really put people at the heart of their business and trying to make sure that their employees are safeguarded, uh, their lives, and then they're focused on their livelihoods and really making sure that the company continues. And so companies are being impacted by the pandemic in all different ways, but I think what's for sure is that every one of them is in fact impacted. And so they're really devoted to their employees and trying to keep everything afloat. And so what I'm seeing is companies have business as usual activities. Some of them were pretty well prepared if they had technology that was on, um, you know, out and about and had been distributed evenly to all of their employees. But we found that many of our clients were actually not prepared from a technology base. So getting people first situated so that they could effectively work from home was first order of business. Once that was done, you know, just getting the morale to stay focused and get um, work done. 
And then on top of that, you know, because we're here and talking about tax administrations, many governments took decisive action and dramatic action um, to, to keep the economies afloat. And so the global stimulus that's been uh, issued has been far reaching and quite, um, quite, quite complicated for companies to avail themselves. So a lot of uh, companies right now are still navigating the labyrinth of these new rules. And so we've been tracking as, as EY, 135 countries, global stimulus, 2,100 legislative changes. You can imagine how hard that is for companies to stay on top of and to try to figure out what they should avail themselves and what they shouldn't, what they're entitled to, what makes sense from a reputational risk perspective. So tax administrations, a lot of questions coming to them to help them, you know, help these companies understand these rules and, um, and navigate them. So there's a tremendous volume of work. And so everybody right now is just suffering a little bit from what we call blurs day, you know, Monday looking like Wednesday, looking like Friday. So I don't know if that resonates for you, but um, you know, what we're certain of is there's no shortage of work. Thank you, Kate. Indeed, it does resonate a lot. And uh, I think it's an interesting interaction that so it's not just that the tax administration are trying, first of all, to look after their own stuff. Uh, but what you're saying is that they're also putting pressure on on the on your companies like yourselves to also see how they can be helped. And uh, so let me turn to Terra. Uh, Terra obviously represents a very important tax administration. And um, Sarah, I know that your staff uh, are currently under lockdown. So how is the org organization handling the multiple competing demands uh, for upholding compliance and collection and providing tax relief to vulnerable groups, maintaining staff productivity and safety, while at the same time uh, they have to respect social distancing and actually stay uh, locked in? What is the experience and does it resonate with uh, Kate's point of view? Um, thank you, Chair. And um, uh, Kenya and KRA has implemented uh, a few um, strategies. Uh, one to keep uh, with the WHO and Ministry of Health uh, directives on social distancing and other regulations. Uh, one of the things that um, the Kenya Revenue Authority has implemented is the use of technology in um, tax um, filing, tax um, payment, and accounting. One of the things that uh, we've uh, been able to do is uh, one of um, the, the care is tough. I've been asked to keep the social distance. And in that sense, uh, we've been able to split um, the teams into um, the on-site and off-site. And those who are working at the off-site are allowed uh, to have VPN the virtual uh, connectivity um, network uh, where they will still have full access as if they're working from their uh, ordinary stations. Um, to do that, it comes along with challenges of uh, cyber security, um, confidentiality of information, the use of public uh, networks. Uh, but then again, CARE has implemented uh, internal um, uh, measures to ensure that the network is kept uh, safe so that we can keep the network and uh, the database for the taxpayers uh, confidential. Uh, in addition, um, KRA has also um, uh, complied with the, with the directives by the president to ensure that uh, people of a certain age uh, at the moment, uh, people above 58 uh, years of age and people with uh, preconditions have been asked to work from home and uh, um, also, people with uh, uh, young children, uh, people with uh, who are ex pre predisposed. Uh, those are the people currently working uh, from uh, or, or, uh, offsite. However, uh, other, not necessarily non-essential, but other um, officers have also been asked to take leave and uh, um, so that we can keep uh, social distancing um, practical. So you can find that uh, at the moment we have almost 50% or at, in some offices, 30% uh, existence of staff, while at the same time keeping all the services uh, running. 
Uh, additionally, we've also asked taxpayers uh, to continue um, obeying the usual requirements of filing returns and payment. And in that case, then, um, any person with, the, with any concern in terms of uh, uh, knowledge of uh, how to be um, helped uh, can actually get in touch with our, with our, uh, with our um, customer service uh, officers who will then be able to advise them on what to do. So those are the few measures that uh, I'll mention at the moment as we progress with the discussion, uh, Kiara. Thank you, Tara. Thank you very much. So interesting how the uh, CARE is uh, basically becoming more creative and trying to adapt uh, to the situation, uh, but still maintaining business continuity. And uh, so now we have heard the experience of Kenya. We'll turn to Raul. Raul is based in Central Asia, in Uzbekistan. Raul, uh, from your point of observation and also point of operation, um, uh, you're helping basically, the World Bank is helping to support some of the low income countries in Central Asia. And what are the key elements to take into consideration to make tax systems more efficient and, and tax administration resilient in the current context? And uh, what do you think are the lessons that we can share with other countries of similar situation with similar challenges? Over to you, Raul. Thank you, Chiara, <clears throat> for my passion then. Um, first of all, I'm gonna talk about the key elements, the key lessons learned in our operations. And I will also talk about the tools that we are using to help uh, task administrations get back on track to help with this recovery phase, phase that Marcelo was mentioning. First of all, um, regarding an efficient administration of the tax system is a critical lesson to have a good understanding of technology and technology is playing a key role as a way to mitigate declining revenues and ensure business continuity. When countries have this capacity in technology, the declining revenues, uh, revenues is only a function of pure economic factors and administrative factors don't have an influence here. Other key lesson that emerges is the need to pay attention to the cycle of maturity, adoption, and certification of specific technologies. For providing uh, the adequate sequence to revenue administrations when it comes to absorbing and adopting new technologies. Other important lesson is that context is of the essence. Countries have different starting points, different levels of readiness, different levels of capacity. Actually, low capacity environments are suffering the most in terms of declining revenues, and they are having more many difficulties in keeping revenue administration completely functional. That is why we are developing a specific analysis, taking into account different levels of capacities. We are developing maturity models for tax we are also developing and implementing a stress test to assess preparedness of revenue bodies to face challenges posed by this crisis. It's also vital to consider the importance of maintaining business continuity. In this regard, we are working with our counterparts in developing these business continuity plans. And this goes far beyond the availability of ICT platforms or IT systems. This includes inter alia maintaining the safety of staff and taxpayers, creating an emergency task force, and continuously providing critical services to taxpayers. It's also important in the which is, I think, the missing link. We need uh, to, to uh, include this governance dimension in our uh, plans. That entails moving towards a governance focus reform agenda. Technology plays a key role. And it's also important to ensure that the administration has in place adequate internal system and clear and timely decision making processes in a rapidly changing environment. What's the, the end game? The end game is uh, clear. The task administration need, they need to move to a digital future. The digital revenue administration of the future will be the default. Of course, the pathways to this end will vary from country to country based on the context. We also need to highlight that there are risks further down the road. There are opportunities for corrupted practices and increased risk of abuse, tax evasion, or tax fraud. In this, I would like to highlight the role of technology as a key element of an anti-corruption strategy. 
through automation and IT enabled procedures, several aspects of task administration activity, activity become less vulnerable to corruption. Finally, there is also an important aspect related to the tax system. Uh, these days, the key element of discussion with our counterparts is the acceleration, the massive acceleration of digital activities or digital transactions. That calls for revamping the tax systems and tailor the tax systems to this new situation. And the debate is shifting from thinking of taxing new activities to, towards defining the traits of these digital business models in order to adapt it to this new situation. I stop here and maybe we can dig deeper into these topics in the following discussion. Uh, thank you, Raul. Um, thank you. And it's uh, so, first of all, I thought it was interesting that the effort, at least from your point of view, or how the World Bank is uh, approaching it for tax administration is to to help them to keep business as usual and uh, and so in a way to distinguish between what could be a revenue loss due to weak tax administration from actually a serious deterioration of the economic performance of the country due to the uh, COVID-19 crisis. And so in a way this effort continues because it's not very different from before the crisis. That's exactly the objective of tax administration. What is new is to try to rethink the business models and certainly, I guess, I think I heard uh, or I'm trying to interpret perhaps that some countries are regretting that maybe they have not made progress or faster progress on adopting technological, I mean, transforming uh, the tax system, tax administration and adopting digital taxation uh, earlier. And um, I know that it's very hard, and I hope we will talk now also with Sandy. What are the challenges, but also the benefits that go well beyond tax administration of leveraging digital technology and modernizing tax uh, systems? Uh, Sandy. Oh, thank I you. Think there is a big saying that there is more to tax than tax. Mm -hmm. uh, and tax administrations possess more data about the economy than perhaps any other government body. And okay. often this is not really tapped on or leveraged. And uh, now with your broad experience and uh, used to think about big data, how can you, what is your wisdom in this? Um, in this? And uh, I guess I leave it to you, but I think what we would like to hear from your experiences, first of all, of course, the advanced economies, um, but also if you have some, some advice or some thoughts for uh, less developed economies, no. How could they improve? So I think the interesting thing here is um, uh, uh, the head of a, a very large bank said to me, um, we had a 10-year plan for going digital and we did it this month. <laughs> so, uh, while we're seeing this as incredible acceleration <laughs> of changing the, the use of digital, the, the way processes happen and so forth. And what we've been involved in is sort of a broadening of the remit of tax authorities. So tax authorities, if you think it more broadly, are the main type of connection between government and the citizens. They're incredibly important, not just for the money that goes out, but also because they give you a view into how the economy is doing, how local neighborhoods are doing, what parts of the economy are doing worse or better. And that lets you shape policy not just for tax, but for everything. And you see that, for instance, in the United States, um, it turns out that you can use tax uh, returns, tax data, to be able to predict things like uh, how well the children will grow up, how risk are they, how, how uh, at risk are people for even diseases and things like that, because poverty, lack of access, lack of opportunity, shows up in the financial data often first, and can be used to, to set policy. Um, so for instance, we're using that in Australia now, working with the government there to help them do economic uh, reconstruction after COVID, because they're fairly past it, uh, but also growth because they're facing a number of unique uh, economic challenges. And so, so tax uh, data, tax authorities are a unique view that the government has into the health of their society. 
And we've been able to work, for instance, with Columbia to be able to use tax data to better target social programs. Uh, so in order to be able to target social programs correctly, you have to know something about the families, the families in the area, the local conditions, and the tax data gives you a view into that that's, that's really unique. At a sort of broader level, uh, so, so, so basically tax is, is a tremendous lever for better government, for more effective government, not just the revenue aspect of it, but all branches of, of policy. And I think a, a good way to think about this is, is that over many, many, many years, uh, uh, tax authorities, governments, but also businesses become siloed. You get these verticals where the, the data stays stuck there. Um, and what we're seeing is that the new technologies that are allow us to bridge between the silos, not to get rid of them, but to allow communication between them. And so, for instance, we've helped set up systems for fidelity investment to help uh, uh, investors, citizens, to move data between banks without uh, risking their personal data. We've worked with Intuit, which does most of the personal taxes in the United States and small businesses, so that uh, small businesses can get a better integrated view of all the different interactions they have with government. And I think that that theme of the digital allowing us to connect silos to be more efficient, to give a more coherent and unified view of what's going on, may be a good way to think about the direction to go for the future. So I'll just stop there. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, this, this is very interesting, and I, I know I'll, I'll go for another round, but uh, perhaps a follow-up question from me, Sandy, on we want to give a sense also from learning from the crisis what, uh, what, could, what could a tax system look like in the future. That's one thing. And I think what you're saying is I, I like this uh, completely different or quite different dimension of looking at tax administrations as uh, not the, the bad guys, but actually a fantastic um, intermediary, as you were saying, between government and citizens to be able to, of course, collect revenues, but also to facilitate uh, the interaction and also okay. help governments to have a better sense of what their citizens' profiles are. Yeah. Now, what I, I think is the challenge for some of us, and especially in countries where Raul is, or even Tara may hopefully may say more, is also the gray economy. There's a lot of informal economy. And uh, I think it's uh, one of the perhaps uh, opportunities of digital technology, but it would be great to hear from you, is also how to capture, not in the negative sense, but how to also bring in these workers, a lot of workers that are actually operating informally without any rights um, in the system. You yeah, so, so you know, the sorts of things that we've done in the past, we were very important in bringing um, uh, sort of digital payments to day workers in Latin America. So day workers are among the poorest in, in uh, Latin America. And by providing them with uh, digital tools on their mobile telephones, they could get better, uh, more efficient employment. So we were making the day labor market more efficient. Uh, in Kenya, of course, you've had for a long time digital payments, and uh, and that's turned out to be something which brings large segments of the of the uh, economy into and, and and changes the level of fraud and the grayness of this market. And I think that that that's a vision of where we can go. Is is that even the poorest uh, can can benefit from having uh, in a very efficient. Uh, digital payments, digital logistics, digital labor, uh, all of the things that uh, uh, go to make up a person's life. And the tax authority can facilitate all of that. Uh, and it's a delicate dance, of course, because you don't want to be the poor people to be seen as uh, victims of, of tax authority. Uh, but um, I think that, that that can be made fairly clear 
particularly if the tax authority begins to be more the interface so that payments as well as tax come through these digital channels. So I think there's a lot of evidence that you can reach all strata of society and just through the advantage of having these easy digital interfaces, the gray markets evaporate over time uh, because it's just easier to operate and uh, it needs to be proved trustworthy and so forth. But but I think that that will happen over time and we can accelerate that. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, this is very interesting. I think it's pretty exciting. I want I'd like to, because the opportunities, it's also to change the face of the tax administration or the way it is perceived. Um, and potentially there can be other functions that can be brought together, of course, with the sensitivities uh, of the way we trust these institutions and the way we perceive them. So it does require also some change in that respect. Uh, but Tara, from your perspective, Kenya, uh, and so different experience from the US or Latin America, what uh, do you think about, um, what is your view about these innovations and the potential? And is, is the Kenyan government and KRA thinking in these terms and how? Um, yeah. yeah, just going back to where Sandy left, um, Kenya is also uh, part of global um, IT revolution. Um, at the moment, we have, I think, one of the largest mobile mobile cash transfers, and uh, much of the economy is reliant uh, on uh, uh, mobile tr uh, cash transfers. Actually, to be precise, one of the uh, COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic uh, response is the shift of cash economy to mobile and uh, online banking as a means of uh, responding to transmission, uh, community transmission. And uh, part of that is also creating a lot of, uh, you know, gray area in terms of tax inversion, uh, because then um, it's highly likely that uh, mobile transfer is done casually as opposed to the ordinary business uh, transactions. Um, some of the things that Kenya and um, indeed part of uh, Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, post-COVID thinking is the future of audits. What is the, given the current uh, social distancing, what is the future of uh, on-site uh, audits and also verification of uh, consignments uh, from international borders? Um, the thinking is, um, probably to have stronger systems, systems that are able to detect uh, fraud, uh, systems that are able to uh, predict um, um, fraud and predict uh, corruption. Um, luckily, we have uh, some of the systems that have been developed, artificial intelligence systems. We have some systems on blockchain management. These are some of the systems that um, we, we, we actually think um, they're the system that will enhance uh, post-COVID uh, recovery strategy. And Kenya and uh, indeed KRA is thinking around the same um, systems. Um, currently, the systems that we use is a system on uh, ITAX, which is domestic tax. It's a system called uh, Simba or ICMS for the customs. We, KRA is thinking around having an artificial intelligence system around the two systems so that as we reduce the contact with the taxpayers, we will, we will be having system detecting what a physical contact would otherwise um, detect. Uh, the, other, the other thinking around the same systems is also the policy review. COVID-19 has indicated or rather shown that there's a shift in terms of sector spending. People are now spending more on necessary items things that are essential services, essential items. And uh, for them to shift to essential uh, goods, like for example, foods, uh, clothing, I mean, even transfer of clothing to foods, those are items that are either exempt or zero rated. Um, <clears throat> highly likely there is very little tax that you can get from it. Uh, supermarkets are now selling more than a construction um, hardware. So 
and of course the tax rates um, uh, applied in the supermarkets are largely lower or some of them are exempt and uh, at the end of the day we'll have less tax collection uh, from uh, these items so going forward uh, COVID-19 has already um, shown that even for uh, policy formulation will then follow the, 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 the cash or the money shifts into other sectors. So those are the few um, strategies that uh, we've been able to... Um, uh, also, um, we also have these uh, systems called uh, bot chats, uh, the artificial intelligence co um, connectivity where Instead of having uh, an interaction between taxpayer and the taxman, for that matter, we'll be having the system having a direct chat with the taxpayer to um, give uh, highlights on registration or filing or even uh, payment. So those are the systems that we are having uh, discussions um, in Kenya going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Tiara. Very interesting uh, overview of what's going on. And uh, I, I really would have a lot of questions to follow up. But let me ask first Raul, uh, that he may bring another perspective. And perhaps, Raul, you mentioned earlier about um, that the risk of fraud or, or uh, non compliance, let's put it that way, is high. Um, I, I would like also to hear a bit from you how these countries are protecting from them, also from bad practices or aggressive practices from large international companies, if, if there is also a risk in that dimension uh, from where you sit. Uh, thanks, Kara. It's a very interesting this point. In any case, there are two things here. One is the measures that countries are adopting these are prone to abuse. For example, when you are you see that some countries are adopting or granting uh, tax holidays. This uh, leads in some cases to companies making some kind of arrangements to game the system. So that's why the controls of the tax uh, ha has to be tightened. In other cases, when you try to expedite the process of granting VAT refunds, this can be also prone to abuse in the sense that some people can benefit from abusing the system. These are the things that we need that, that we need to take control of that. The other thing that is that we have to expect an aggravated risk of non-compliance further down the road. And this is what we can expect from, from this situation. And that means that we need to help countries reformulate their compliance and enforcement strategies. We have to expect an increase in tax arrears in tax rates. We have to, in, to expect that some companies maybe will abuse the system in terms of carrying forward the revenue losses. And of course, the international tax problems regarding uh, transfer pricing will continue. But definitely, there are two dimensions to this problem. One is that the measures that we are adopting, they have to be closely monitored in order to, to, to be sure that the, the system is, is not abused. And on the other hand, we need to think about the recovery phase. Uh, we need to help uh, tax administration to get back uh, to get back on track in this recovery. In order to be able to control this uh, widespread non-compliance uh, situation that we expect. Thank you, Raul. Kate, I think you're sitting in a very important position because you are basically covering EY worldwide in tax administration. And I'm sure there is a lot to learn from your clients. And uh, if you had a crystal ball or if you tell based on all we hear, but also what you know, and uh, what do you see tax administrations around the world uh, going forward? Uh, let's assume this, as Marcelo said, the COVID crisis, we will get over it. The economy will recover, but of course there are things that will be different. There will be a new norm. And uh, you heard Raul, we need to think about reformulation of how we should think about compliance, the role of tax administrations uh, as also kind of intermediaries or integrators between citizens, taxpayers and government. What is your, how do you, if you could say or think, what, is, what would 
the tax administration look like um, in the future? And then also, what is the role that you foresee for this prosperity collaborative uh, that we have today on the agenda? Well, thank you, Kara. Maybe picking up on, I'll make two points, um, picking up on the thread before. One of the things that we've observed in the current situation in the pandemic is that some of the developed markets actually have a lot to learn from the developing markets. And so the emerging markets, in some instances, their technology platforms supporting their tax administration have been actually more digitally enabled and have really fostered the stimulus and a lot of things that the government wanted to do to get cash to the right hands and, and the like. And so, um, you know, I had a recent client uh, share with me um, out in Seattle that they actually had to leave their, um, their house with their family because in some cases they had to go back into the corporate headquarters to um, actually do wet signatures. And so there were some countries around the world that are still requiring a wet signature in order to do a really critical filing. And so many of the developing countries out there have actually moved past that and have allowed digital signatures. I know a small thing, but a big deal uh, for a big multinational that um, I thought was an interesting experience. So I don't want to lose that thread, but I think the way forward, I mean, to answer your question about what we see on the horizon is we see that tax policy is going to be front and center in the days ahead. And so tax administrations who are really responsible for executing on that are going to play a critical role. When you think about the amount of debt that so many countries around the world have just gone into to support the stimulus, I mean, right now the stimulus in the United States is 37% of the economy, uh, their GDP. Um, worldwide, it's 20% around the world, and you know, countries will vary. So it's substantial. So where is this going to get paid? And so one of the things that I think we're going to see is increased taxes. They're going to come in different forms. This morning, the EU, so the European Union, came out with uh, their plan of attack here on how they're going to pay for the stimulus in the European Union. And so I think that we're going to see more jurisdictions come out. So, you know, will we see, for example, in the United States, um, a U.S. federal VAT? Um, you know, again, it's never been politically um, uh, favorable. And so typically any, any officer who puts in a VAT does not get reelected. But, you know, uh, we'll see whether that happens or will we see carbon taxes. So there's going to be, you know, I think more taxes, which only puts more uh, onus, if you will, on tax administrations because they have to administer all of this. And, and I think we're seeing the importance of having healthy call lines, you know, call centers. You have that. Do you, are you using technology to the fullest? Are all your people enabled? Do they, um, uh, do they have the proper laptops in case they do need to work from home, not just desktops back in the office? So there's so much here that I think we're going to see in the future. And I think the Prosperity Collaborative can play a critical role in trying to make sure that, um, you know, governments all over the world are really prepared for this, um, for this new norm that we're all envisioning. Thank you, Kate. And while we are discussing, let me invite the audience if they have questions. Um, I, sorry, I just just to clarify that they can email to dge so d i g i at newamerica dot org, or they can tweet hashtag uh, prosperity collaborative. So don't be shy. Ask questions. Uh, we have colleagues that are picking them up. And uh, I, I'd like also to open the floor to a few questions. But while uh, we are uh, waiting, and Erin is helping with the rest of the team to collect them, um, Sandy, I want to push this thing of innovation. I know it will be also for panel two, but, um, and yes, uh, Kate has given us the perspective that tax policy will be extremely important. So fiscal policy in general, because we will have to rein in this large expenditure and expansionary fiscal policy that have been helping to respond to the crisis in the short term, but we need to find a solution for the long term. So this is, this is to us, the economists. I'd like to believe that there is more to it, that with digital technology, it's 
possible to do things that we would not be able to do before. And also because of digital technology, let me take a step backwards. Sarah said, look, the, the consumption pattern is changing now. So part of the, so even if we have a super perfect tax administration that is super efficient and is able to capture or, you know, to have a full control of the tax base, there is a shifting pattern and right now consumers or taxpayers are mostly consuming, which is obviously VAT or tax, sales tax type of uh, tax base. Um, mostly uh, items that actually have a low tax or a zero tax. By law, by law, it's normal. So there is a natural decline in revenue. And maybe those patterns will not change back fast. Even if we reopen and we go back to normality. So there is an issue of challenge of tax base. The other is that there is, we are seeing that the industrial or um, the sectors, there is definitely a skew towards technology companies. And the expectation is very much a concentration of businesses. We are looking at Amazon now, they're providing all sorts of services from credit lines to a grocery to all sorts of things and delivered at your doorstep. How many, so we will see probably a concentration of these large businesses and at the expenses of others. And what will that mean then in terms of tax collection, tax base, tax policy, and, and also digital taxation, you know, I think you so, might see so, opportunity. Yeah, so one of the, I mean, there, there's two separate things I think that are interesting to talk about. One is um, having a lot more holistic view and real-time view of the economy, which these new systems can do. So, like for instance, the things that we did with Fidelity Investment and with um, Intuit were blockchain systems that gave more unified views to the customer, to the citizen of what was going on, but also allowed much more unified management of trends like investment trends and tax trends uh, by these uh, major organizations. So, so there's this sort of linking the silos uh, and allowing uh, things to flow digitally between them will allow you to adapt to these things uh, and decide what to do. A second thing is, is that, you know, all of our taxes tend to be based on where the service or the labor was performed. So they're geographically located, but of course, digital things aren't that way. And this is one of the major uh, challenges is, is that the people who are making, who are growing dramatically are people who are providing digital services like Amazon and so forth. Um, and uh, the question is, is how should they be taxed? And uh, I think that that requires a sort of basic rethinking of tax policy because the whole point of tax is to provide uh, support for the externalities outside of the economy. So education, healthcare, infrastructure, things that support the economy, but are not formally part of the economy. And what the digital things are doing is, is breaking that connection between local infrastructure and local business. It's now local infrastructure, but it's done in Seattle. And, and, uh, Digital things do allow you to be able to allocate tax correctly. And in fact, VAT is a, is a very good step in that direction. So one, one can imagine uh, that there is a new generation of VAT, which is uh, called something like local reinvestment tax, okay? <laughs> which I think might be more popular than VAT, um, which uh, takes, uh, the value added by the digital things and returns a share of that to support the local infrastructure. So this is a, a, a thing I think I'm very excited about because we have this fundamental disconnect now between how taxes are assessed. They're based on the sort of geography far too much. And, and they need to actually talk about not where the thing is made, but what is the infrastructure we need to pay for and how does that infrastructure support the economy? So I hope that was clear. It's a, it's a very different way to think about taxes, but I think we're going to have to challenge, how do we tax these digital services, which are not, not here, they're there, 
but yet they need to support the schools and the health care and, and things like that locally. I think it's crystal clear. Thank you, Sandy. I think it's, um, it's a good encouragement and I hope we will talk more later. I just received, I see I have one question. Um, and then I think um, I'll, if there are no more questions, I'll, I'll push the, the, our panel. Uh, but Tara, there is a question for KRA basically, and one of the um, participants in the audience would like to commend KRA for embracing the online tax returns. But they're also asking, what is um, is control can can control be an issue? And uh, for example, what is done to authenticate donations? Are taxpayers asked to submit receipts online as evidence? So I think it's a bit of a question related to tax avoidance, and uh, and so and maybe you can also share with us what is KRA thinking while they are embracing the online tax returns, where you see the risks are, and also how you have organized yourself to address the risk and how to um, respond to the risks. Uh, thank you, Kara, and thank you. Um... Uh, the person giving the question. Um, KRA has been running an online um, tax system, uh, both for the income tax, VAT, um, uh, excess tax. It all allows uh, online filing and uh, online authentication. Uh, part of the system includes registration, which would then link to the original database if it's personal registration. If, for example, it's a registration of company, then um, the system uploads the original registration details as part of validation from the registrar of companies. At the same time with the individuals from the registrar of persons, uh, births and deaths. So that then uh, validates um, the authenticity of the person registering the, the, uh, for the tax. Uh, additionally, uh, once the um, the transactions are done, um, the taxpayer is allowed by virtue of the system, is allowed to upload um, a ledger, um, the transaction, the particular transactions. If, for example, it's a payroll, then each and every of the employee with a PIN and ID number, identification, personal identification number, is linked to the salary and all the exemptions and all the uh, other benefits. And uh, the total is given as a total payable by the company. So we actually do individual tax ledger reconciliation. Uh, for the small transaction, which I think uh, the questioner had in mind is the VAT, uh, where the transactions are done for the whole month. We have 20th of subsequent month as our filing date. So all the transactions done in the previous month up to the last day of the month is submitted online um, through the system. However, we've been having a, a system called electronic tax register, which does not is not um, does not meet the requirements of some of the countries' uh, uh, ledger, which is presented as the transaction is happening. However, KRA is developing a system that, is, uh, that will then allow the taxpayer, as the transaction is done, the same transaction is submitted to our, our, our system, which will then give us, uh, by date, by time, by minute and by second, the, the transaction as it happens. So that is what we are, uh, we are doing, and uh, it's part of the effect of the, of the COVID-19 uh, because we, we were intending to um, launch the program, it is still on course. Um, KRA is going to implement the same uh, program that will then have um, instant transmission of data to our database. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. Um, so we have very few minutes. I'd like to give you all a moment, a, a one minute of uh, the last speech, if you want to make it. And I'd like to start from Kate. Kate, what is your last message for this 
the audience today and for this panel. One minute each. You know, I would ask all tax administrations to embrace technology. I think it is the way forward. And, you know, in this digital world that we live in, we need to serve the taxpayers and the companies that are employing the taxpayers. And, you know, we're all together in the same ecosystem. So having more state of the art, being more digitally enabled would be super helpful. Thank you. Raul. A word from you. Well, two key messages very quickly. Uh, first of all, as I mentioned during my first intervention, uh, the taxation of digital economy is very relevant and we have to revamp the tax systems. And we have to think of a different way to touch digital activities, as it has been also said. We need to think about the defining traits and disrupting aspects of digital business models. The second message is that, of course, technology is the future, but we have different levels uh, of capacity. And one important thing is when you factor in political economy elements. For example, in some countries, we have seen a lot of resistance to change, to adopt technologies because of corruption issues. So this is something that we need to incorporate into our programs. I stop here. Uh, thank you, Raul. Uh, Sandy. Well, I think that the, at the highest level, it's clear that we have a great number of challenges coming at us and that uh, generically the only way to address those challenges is through innovation. Um, one of the things I think we should do, which is a little different than people have done in the past, is experiment more. So you might think about instead of setting up a system for the whole country at a time, do it for a city or two and see how it works first, uh, because you could be pleasantly su uh, surprised or you could decide that there's some real problems. Uh, so that much more experimental, innovative mindset where you're trying out new solutions rather than proclamating final uh, s solutions is, I think, uh, an important aspect of the, all this. Thank you. And Tara, your last uh, words of wisdom. Uh, thank you, Tara. And um, Karen is uh, grateful to be part of the Prosperity Collaborative Framework. And uh, Karen is happy to um, share its experiences uh, through this COVID-19 um, challenge. Um, I joined also other panelists in uh, embracing technology is the only solution that is going to um, uh, have collection of taxes likely it's going to be unlikely that we're going to rely on uh, debt as all, every country is uh, affected uh, through this COVID-19 so um, domestic revenue mobilization is key uh, for every country and carry is aware and carry is alive to the fact that uh, uh, domestic uh, revenue mobilization is, uh, is uh, part of our agenda uh, digital economy is also um, the high table uh, for every country. Uh, we are aware that uh, there's a discussion both at the United Nations level and the OECD level, on the taxation of digital economy uh, through the unified, and uh, of course, unified and unilateral methods. Um, I want, um, or rather I'm asking that uh, World Bank should also be part of this collaborative framework, should be part of this discussion. Um, since uh, it's, going, it's going to be um, the next uh, discussions global. Um, thank you very much, uh, Chara and the other panelists. Well, thank you all very much. I just want to reassure everybody the World Bank is very much part of this discussion and we are really um, very engaging in this uh, collaborative. Um, I want to thank you because I'm thinking what we've learned today, it's, uh, um, in a way, I think we've been encouraged to think beyond, outside the box, to be much more agile, and I think also try to, and I think the World Bank can help in this regard, is to really leverage experiences globally. And while uh, Sandy was talking about experimentation, there are already a lot of countries that are experimenting uh, because there are different levels. So there are great opportunities to do what uh, we call in our Jargon South Side initiatives as well. And um, but I want to thank you. You're a fantastic panel. And uh, now I will hand over to 
uh, Tomika Tilleman, uh, who's uh, going to chair the next panel. A big round of applause to all of you, and uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Chair, for that very kind introduction. Our gratitude to the panelists, an incredible array of insights that we've all been fortunate to be privy to this morning. Uh, and also my thanks to our incredible partners at the World Bank, EY, MIT, and the Boston Global Forum. Uh, it's a real pleasure and a privilege to collaborate with all of you in this effort. If you believe Oliver Wendell Holmes, the former justice of the US Supreme Court, who said that taxes are the price we pay for living in a civilized society, then this is a conversation that goes to the very core of our civilization. And frankly, at a time when the foundations of that civilization are looking a little bit shaky, it is tough to overestimate and overstate the magnitude and the criticality of the issues that we're gonna be talking about today. As I welcome our next panel, I want you to welcome them as folks who are literally in the trenches fighting the fight to defend our civilization. They are doing the hard work necessary to ensure that our institutions have the resources they need uh, to continue providing all of us uh, with the services uh, and the rule of law and the, the institutional oversight uh, that is necessary in order for our nations and civilizations to function properly. Uh, so this is immensely important work and we could not have better people with us uh, to help us move this conversation forward. Uh, I'm going to start uh, by welcoming uh, Jackie Wright, the Chief Digital Officer from Microsoft and the former head over all digital strategy at HMRC, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, which is the tax authority uh, for the British government. Her Excellency Siri Che, Assistant Governor of the National Bank of Cambodia, spearheading some incredibly innovative efforts in that country, and we'll hear about those in greater detail. Jeffrey Cooper, who is now uh, with the SAS Institute. Previously, he was executive director of IRS criminal investigations. So he has seen a thing or two in his day. We're eager to get his insights. Uh, and then, of course, Jeff Saviano <clears throat> of EY's uh, Global Tax Innovation Center, their leader for global tax innovation, uh, a dear friend and an incredible champion on these issues. Uh, I am going to begin, Jeff, with you, if you're amenable. You have played a key role in standing up the Prosperity Collaborative. Uh, and for all those that are listening today, and we want to reiterate the point made in the last panel, we want to hear from those that are participating virtually. Please tweet your questions with the hashtag, hashtag Prosperity Collaborative or send them to digi, D-I-G-I, at newamerica.org. Uh, but Jeff, in standing up the Prosperity Collaborative, you recognize that we needed a new type of coalition uh, to solve these challenges. Tell us a little bit about your thinking in creating the Prosperity Collaborative. What are you trying to accomplish and why is it so important right now in a world that is struggling to recover from the coronavirus pandemic? Okay, great. Thank you. Appreciate the introduction and really am honored and excited to participate Today, as a founding member of the Prosperity Collaborative, you're working with our collaborators and obviously to Micah, including you, working very closely with you and all of our collaboration partners to solve complex tax problems in the world. Our vision, we have such a, a, a high vision for the collaborative is to have great impact. We want to be transformational. We want to transform fiscal and tax systems with innovative technology. Important to us, we came up with this idea. We hatched the idea for the collaborative before there was any hint of the pandemic that we're in. But frankly, we're finding that the purpose of the collaborative is even more relevant today as we're all struggling and helping institutions emerge from uh, the COVID-19 uh, lockdowns. So at the heart of it, we believe we need more effective digital solutions. We create artificial intelligence and blockchain and data scientists that have been focused on really big problems in the world across sectors like healthcare and transportation, but we believe that now is the time for tax and fiscal systems. We wanna apply the great minds of those new advanced technologies to solve these tax problems. Uh, the idea out of a workshop. We held that at MIT with the founding members just about uh, a year ago. And I want to go back to a point that Marcelo raised at the opening to Micah. One of the 
purpose is to achieve this collective intelligence. And we love that phrase, great people enabled by great technology. Really important that no single institution has on the problem solving. We need a multidiscipline, multidisciplinary effort. The sector, private sectors and civil society all coming together. Kate said this in the last panel as well to solve those big tax problems. So we we expect the collaborative to be at the very heart of setting new standards. We have a. a I'll finish this on this point, Tamika, that we've got such a great vision. We're executing on this great vision, and we're really looking forward to collaborating with not only our an enormous amount of uh, tax evasion and uh, you know, efforts th throughout your career uh, to, to try to get around taxes. What countries missing uh, by virtue of having you know, what are in too many cases pretty imperfect antiquated systems uh, that are responsible for public revenue and public finance? Okay, first, um, thank you for the opportunity to participate on, on this um, distinguished panel. And um, to, to, to answer your question, though, really, um, I think it's an opportunity for a whole of government uh, approach. Um, I've been I spent 30 years with um, Internal Revenue Service um, fighting crime on the civil and, and, and criminal side of the house. Um, now embracing technology with SAS and helping countries around the world to really address um, some of some of their problems. And really, the, the data tells the story is something that that I've always said. And the question is, what what story does it tell? Um, economic crime, though, is the the largest um, crime in the world. Um, OECD had estimated it in 2016 to be around 3.1 trillion dollars. Uh, I would suspect that that definitely um, has increased. Um, what what challenges that that are out there is with data. Data is something that that um. Even now, as we look at the COVID and the response to COVID, it's just more data. It used to be that cash is king. Well, that's that's pretty changed in this new new way that we live, this new normal. Um, but analyzing that data is critical because data without analytics is really value not yet realized. Um, so around the world, some countries are 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 asking SaaS and other technology leaders for for help. Because now this new norm um, is something that they're struggling with um, economic forecasting. Well, what's the impact of this on a revenue on, on a country? Um, and how do they how do they now relate to the taxpayers? What's that new taxpayer behavior is going to be? Um, do you send out letters to, to taxpayers to, to get a response? What is the collection aspect? Going to be um, workforce analytics. Some of the some of the comments on the last panels kind of talked about um, the digital economy, but now how do you tax the digital economy? Um, last year, I, I wrote a blog, and I was looking in 2019, looking at some of the international tax trends and for non-compliance. And it's funny because um, transfer pricing was really high high on that list. I know one of the other panelists kind of talked about transfer pricing and some of the multinational corporations and some of the flat out just abuses that are out there. But now with COVID and stimulus, well, that just becomes exacerbated even more. Um, but those are some of the things that, that we're looking at there. Um, fraud though, so as we, we talk about um, stimulus payments around the world, what type of oversight is it going to be there? So companies now really and governments really have to look at um, how to look at the fraud as it relates to that. What is that going to look like? How do you identify some of these bad bad actors out there? Because out of crisis comes opportunity, but that same opportunity is for the fraudsters as well. And, and governments really have to work together to to address that. So this brings up a number of really important points. And Jackie, I want you to help us out uh, on this. Uh, you and I were having a conversation a few days ago 
Uh, and one of the key themes we talked about was something Jeffrey just raised, which is uh, data and how data can be used to solve these tough challenges around tax and public finance. Tell us what you've seen that has worked and also what you see on the horizon that could be helpful. You and I, for example, discussed some new models of data sharing where you put the citizen at the center of your data architecture and have the citizen share data back and forth across agencies. Uh, and in doing so, you can overcome a lot of the traditional limitations that have been put in place uh, on interagency data sharing. So there's some innovative models emerging. What have you seen that has worked and what are you seeing that could work in the future? Yeah, thank you for that, Tomika. Now, one of the things that, you know, the, the previous panelists discussed was this convergence of the digital economy and citizen services. And so when you think about, and, and, you know, I'd like to separate developed from developing countries, because what we're seeing is that in the developing countries, they are thinking about where it is, where they are and what they're doing right now. Um, the developed countries have a history, they have a legacy, and they have systems that are, have yet to be realizing the potential of this new digital economy. So when you when you look at all of the technologies that are going on around, the, the, the central part of that is around the identity of the citizen, capturing the services at the point of transaction. And so in order to do that, you have to really think about an identity of a citizen. And so in countries such as Estonia, where, you know, a small country, but the ability to federate really quickly, um, they have digital identity. Um, there are concepts that are coming out with innovative people and technologies around owning the data yourself. So you yourself have an identity. You have what's called kind of like a digital cabinet where you own your information. And that information is shared when needed, needed for the point of services. Data at the heart of that is then federated across to do things such as looking at the economic levers, the levers around how are we affecting and changing the digital nature of what we're doing from an economy perspective. And then there's the AI and machine learning and deep learning around capturing fraud and compliance. And what we need to think about and what's actually happening is um, Jeffrey's point about cash is king and now it's digital. We're moving up the chain in terms of looking at fraud and identifying fraud earlier on in the transactional processing end to end. These are some of the things that we're starting to see. When you think about the digital citizen services, the other thing we think we're seeing is the nature of using your device, capturing real time and using chatbots to really anticipate what a customer needs, what a citizen needs, how you interact with them, and really anticipating the services required to mitigate fraud, to improve the ability to capture the revenue, and then really on the back end to look at the end-to-end -end services of how you deliver those services more effectively. Fantastic. Well, you raised one side of this equation, uh, which is how these systems are starting to be adopted in the global north. Estonia is a country that we benchmark a lot. They have incredible systems and uh, it's inspiring to see what they've done. Siri, you are uh, at some level on the other side of this equation. You know, you're coming from a country uh, that has a, a very long history of adversity. Uh, Cambodia has had some uh, profound challenges, and yet you are creating new digital infrastructure that in many cases is leapfrogging uh, what exists in the global north. Tell us what that process entails and what are some of the lessons you're learning along the way? And specifically, I'm sure everyone watching would love to hear more about your work on digital payments and how that's impacting tax uh, and your ability to collect revenue. Thank you, Tamika, um, for inviting me to join. I'm coming in with um, no expertise in technology and no expertise in tax uh, whatsoever. Um, so I'm sure you're surely... still making us all look bad. So, uh... um, so I mean, I, I've been listening to the previous sessions, mentionings about you know you you just have to try and test and see how it goes. So when um, at the National Bank of Cambodia, which is the country central bank, we implemented our mobile payment system, uh, uh, introduced mobile payment system regulations, oversight, etc. Uh, we didn't have in mind that we're going to solve the tax issue. 
or the governance issues. It was purely for financial inclusions. And eventually, as we go, we discovered the power it, it could have on, on, on um, tax collection. So um, I think one of the lessons that we, we've learned is um, creating and enabling a regulatory framework. Um, that is very important because you could look at, um, I mean, a lot of the times when, I mean, that this is a sort of a personal experience is that we um, often when we hear about technology and we're not a technologist ourselves, we tend to sort of be um, worried and, and frightened by anything new. Um, and um, I think here at, at the bank, we adopt this approach that um, let's try and see what work and, and that's how we um, adopt these blockchain technology, the use of blockchain technology in our payment system, actually one of the first in the world. Um, so an enabling uh, environment uh, for innovations uh, is very important. Um, so when we promote our mobile payment services, um, we didn't realize that our tax department um, has been also benefiting from it. So initially it was purely for people in the remote area to be able to access to formal financial services. But the tax department decided to use that as well to collect a tax payment from the people. And um, since that introduction, we've seen tax collection improve tremendously. Now it's not, of course, purely because of this, but in a way it has helped people feel more First, it's there's the, the ease of paying tax. Second, it's the um, um, the trust as well in paying tax because now I pay tax, I know it goes directly to an account and not somebody collecting cash from me and, and probably, you know, you've got um, some leakages in between. Um, and then um, we also look at the interoperability of our system. How can we help, uh, for instance, everyone who have a bank account in one bank to be able to pay uh, tax regardless of you know what bank what service provider you're using um, so that's that's something that um, we we think it's it's important uh, in terms of you know introducing new technology in uh, into this fantastic so picking up on some of the themes that Siri just mentioned a moment ago Jeff I, I want you to come back in and help us Siri raised blockchain as one of the tools that they are uh, utilizing in Cambodia and seeing some really powerful results uh, as it's implemented. You are also a leader in this space. Tell us how you are starting to fuse blockchain and AI to build platforms that can have a transformational impact uh, when it comes to the work of revenue authorities around the world. Sure. Um, that very point of this convergence, we see a, a convergence with artificial intelligence and the, the comments that were made by the panelists on the importance of data uh, were so uh, spot on systems and blockchain and uh, finding new utility for data is of the highest importance to us that was the founding principle of our advanced technology lab at ey that we formed for solving tax problems is one of convergence we believe that there are too many artificial intelligence labs that are separate from a blockchain lab, which is separate from data analytics. And we think that bringing them together makes a lot of, um, makes a lot of sense. I want to go back to some points that were raised by Jeffrey on uh, the utility of data. One of the areas that we've been studying quite a bit is this utility privacy dichotomy. What we found is that the relationship between utility of, of data and necessary privacy principles has been one of a trade-off. That is that the more sensitive the data is, then the higher the threshold for privacy and security, but the utility of using that data is actually quite low. You have low utility of aggregating data to inform complex tax problem solving. And we think that that's gonna change. And I think this is a really important development in the world, we have new computational methods. To give you an example from Sandy Pentland's lab and our last panel, Connection Science at MIT, they've devised a theory called open algorithm theory where they query data and return answers to those queries without the multiple uh, <laughs> risky transfers of that data. 
And we think that new computational methods like this will be a real game changer in this utility privacy dichotomy. We think that, that what the near future will hold is that you can have highly sensitive data uh, uh, adhere to the strictest security standards and, and privacy thresholds and also get high utility from that data. And that's something that I think uh, is one of the more important areas that uh, the, co the collaborative will uh, address. Uh, so, so address please. Like your questions on blockchain and and why in particular that is uh, important to us. If you believe in the Gartner hype cycle of technology, where this 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 initial rising ascent of an interest in a new technology, so it reaches a, a certain height at the very very peak of a mountain, and almost inevitably it's it's followed by a decline in expectations as you climb the mountain of of interest in a new technology. Sometimes there's a lot of hype and you'll come down the other side and ultimately you'll reach the bottom, which some call the trough of disillusionment. Because I think blockchain has just, it is in the process now of emerging from this trough of disillusionment. I think we're about right now ready because of the great work in countries like Cambodia and others to start climbing that ascent of reasonable expectations and utility from a great, uh, technology like blockchain. I'll pause on that to Mike. I wonder if the hype cycle you believe is 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 relevant to how we look at blockchain. Uh, absolutely. And uh, I think we are seeing it play out in real time before our eyes on on this front. And you know that provides a, a great backdrop uh, for turning to Jeffrey. You know, Jeffrey, when you were pursuing cases at the IRS, what are the tools that you wish you had had access to? Are, are there things that could have helped you? You know, we've heard some really intriguing suggestions from Siri, from Jackie, from Jeff. What are the, the things that could have helped in your work? And, you know, by extension, what do you see on the horizon that might fill those gaps going forward? All right, great, thank you. Um, as far as some of the things that I that I saw while I was a special agent that I um, needed, that I thought that would need to, to help me to, um, to further the investigation. One of the, one of the things I, I would always say is that, of course, the data tells the story, but IRS criminal investigation, we're really good at following the money. And one of the things, but following the money by definition means that you are a step behind. I always wanted to know where the money was going. Um, as we did some of the cases, um, um, breaching the corporate um, structure in Swiss in Switzerland and some of the banks there looking to see where that 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 money went. But also though, embracing really the whole of government approach, uh, one frustration that, that I used to have is that even within the United States, there were different government agencies that had data that was rev um, relevant to tax evasion and money laundering. But because of, like you said, because of privacy, and different laws um, and rules and regulations within the United States. Um, sometimes it was really difficult to get information from, from other agencies and to be able to, to utilize it in real time. Um, so I think that there's an opportunity to, to have this whole of government approach where as for the IRS, for instance, so um, as you look at the stimulus payments now and the potential fraud that's going to be there, where you have the Small Business Association, well, they have data, Social Security Office has data, Internal Revenue Service has data, um, Bureau of Physical Affairs, and, and all the other government agencies. So as an investigator, to be able to, to have a unified platform where you can see across those agencies and be able to, to utilize that data. Um, on an international level, there are certain um, organizations, um, the J5 and, and other organizations that we work together um, to, to, to tackle common problems, um, to come up with some, some type of um, common solutions. But as far as um, technology on the, on the forefront, um, I think that the, the fraud solutions that, that look at beneficial ownership um, and corporate security um, is definitely something that needs to be enhanced. Um, even the United States in some circles are considered a, a tax haven. So um, developing solutions that really address that particular area, also the, the transfer pricing, the um, base erosion, um, looking at cloud migration, all right, for, for, for instance, putting things in the cloud um, and bringing the, the math to the data 
so to speak. Because like uh, we we all keep talking about data, the data does not go away, and data without anal analytics is just value not yet realized. And then the other thing, though, with this data, and as you build these models, is you have to be able to deploy them and use them. Because a lot of countries don't don't use it. They'll they'll build a really good model. Well, and that's just becomes to me a, a good science project, right? If you don't, if you can't utilize it and have some output there. So those are some of the things that, that I see. So Jackie, let's zoom back on the point that Jeffrey just raised, because I think it's absolutely essential. I'm sure you experienced this at uh, uh, the revenue, uh, revenue and customs when you were there, and uh, I'm sure you're seeing this at Microsoft as well. You can have perfect technology. You can have a, a beautiful, beautiful technical system. But unless you deal with the human dimensions uh, of these platforms, you're not going to get the results you want. And, and what we find often in our work is that technology is actually the easy part of this equation. Uh, people are hard. People are complicated. What are some of the non-technical things that revenue authorities should be thinking about as they try to implement better systems? And, and do you have advice and best practices that you can share uh, both from your time with the UK government and at Microsoft uh, that will help get us to better outcomes, even when the technology is, is working exactly the way it should? Uh, what are things that can go right and go wrong when you're dealing with people? Yeah, absolutely. I mean. It first starts, and you're right, and you're absolutely right. Technology is only as good as the ability to adopt, to learn and consume the services. And so the, at the heart of it, it's about thinking about the role of the tax authority. That's the core. And when you think about the tax authority, and Alex spoke about that in the previous panel, about the role of tax, the tax authority is to fund public services and to provide services. And so when you think about that, you think about the role that your data needs to play in terms of providing services, providing insight, providing the compliance, the payment, all of those, you think about it differently. You also have to understand how well people understand technology. And in an, in an organization such as HMRC, where the, the average tenure may be about 30 years, the ability to adopt and use the technology services are very limited. So you have to provide ongoing training, ongoing adoption of the services. These cloud services, people don't know how to use them. People don't know how to use basic services. And so training is core to that. And so culturally, change management, let's think about change management in a whole new way in terms of how a tax authority needs to think about its services it wants to deploy. We got a great question from the audience uh, that I think provides a, a good segue to, to Siri. Uh, the, the question that came in was, uh, can you provide advice for tax administrations in low-income countries where the operations are barely digitized at all? And Siri, you and I have talked about the issue of sequencing in the past and how crucial it is to get the right technologies deployed in the right order. What's your counsel uh, to those in, in countries that are starting from a low threshold of digitization and specifically how should they think through the sequencing of technologies to ensure that they're getting the best possible outcomes? Um, so before I touch on the sequencing, I want just to touch on what you've asked Jackie before on the technology yes. versus the human dimensions. And I think um, what is also relevant is, I, I think the technology part is the easiest uh, to solve, right? Uh, but the most difficult is, of course, human, political, and regulatory dimension. Um, and I do see it this way. I'm, I mean, I'm a bank regulator versus the tax uh, department. And we, we do have um, different views in certain ways. I mean, we, we protect the depositors privacies but at the same time you know the tax department would also like to see everything about you know who is not paying tax um, and this is the whole i mean we can debate on this uh, forever but i think it's it's very important that we we get this clear and that there's a, a really strong political will to do that and that's also go to the uh, second questions that you asked me about um, i mean i don't have any advice but i think um, what is very important is the, the the willingness, the political will to do that. Technology is only one small thing um, to tackle. 
um, and and also to I think the the other thing is to how do you get people to um, want to pay tax, which is a very interesting question. So how do you get people to want? Nobody want to pay tax, but how do you make it in a way fun to pay tax, right? Um, this is also an, an important, I think that what I've, I've learned from how our tax department here has been um, trying to convince people to go on their mobile application and it make it so sort of trendy, so fashionable that, oh, I, I take my phone and I, I push this button and tax is paid and everyone is happy. This is really, uh, so it, it's communication as well. So, I mean, there's a whole lot of dimension to it. Um, there, there, and I think, really, I think technology is, is, the, is the last part. The, 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 the next things also in terms of sequencing is that when, I mean, this is again, from pure personal experience, when, when our tax department approached us, um, and, and this is bearing in mind that only 50% of the population have access to formal financial services. And that the, even though mobile uh, money or e-money um, is popular, it, it has not been as widespread as we wish it to be. Um, so when the tax department approaches and say, well, we, we want information on um, those who receive payment through electronic means. So whether cards, whether QR, whether whatever that is, um, so that we'll be able to better tax them. And immediately my reaction, that was about you know, four or five years ago, my, my reaction was that um, I'm glad to hear that, I'm willing to help you, but I'm not going to do it now. And, and the reason is because um, when, when you try to adopt this, people usually get very suspicious on what you're, you, you know, um, if, if I haven't touched on electronic payment before, I'm a merchant and I'm, I'm a, you know, a shop. And suddenly I'm told at the moment I uh, put in a POS machine or I put a QR code to collect my payment, uh, the tax guy will come and chase after me. Immediately my reaction- Not a very, was, not a very attractive proposition. <laughs> no, no I, I'll just stick to cash. Uh, so I, I was actually trying to uh, convince them that how about we wait until the adoptions is more sort of ingrained. Um, in a way, um, put it simply, it's, it's just get them addicted to, to this mobile payment, to the, the ease of it. Um, and then you come in the tax element to it. And, and that would be you know, much easier because now they're hooked into it. It will be very difficult for them to pull out. Um, so that's, that's, that sequencing is, is very important, particularly in, in, in a developing country when you are used to a cash economy and it doesn't really matter uh, to most of these people because the moment, I mean, what is really scared here for a lot of the merchant, I mean, I've got friends who own restaurants and so on. Um, what really scared them is that they, they would ask me, if, if I put a POS machine, uh, would the tax department know how much I'm making uh, a day, right? Um, and I say them well technically yes. Um, but so yeah, so so this time of, th th this kind of sequencing is actually very important. Well, and I, I love that it's both a matter of technical sequencing, but also bringing people along with these different solutions. And uh, you know, maybe your gamification idea can uh, feature in that. Uh, how do you? I, I think of the incredible uh, boosts in engagement that come when certain unnamed social platforms uh, will inject confetti into the posting process. You know, if you post congratulations, uh, you get a little burst of confetti and it turns out that people are radically more likely to uh, post if there's a little boost to confetti uh, when they uh, are putting something on social media. Maybe we need to be looking at the tax equivalent uh, of confetti cannons, digital confetti cannons for those that file their taxes. Jeff, turning to you uh, for a moment, whether it's confetti cannons or uh, other uh, more, more mundane forms of technology, we have really had a, a great ongoing discussion in the Prosperity Collaborative about the use of digital public goods, which is a new concept uh, to provide solutions around the world, but especially in the global south, 
when it comes to addressing some of these issues. Can you talk with us a bit about what is a digital public good and why it's an intriguing proposition for those that are looking to address some of the challenges confronting revenue authorities relating to tax? Uh, sure. First, that's the uh, first I've ever heard tax and confetti in the same, the same utterance. So um, I have to give that's the last time. We're we're getting crazy here. Uh, let's talk about digital public goods and and this question of the governance of of technology. And you and I, uh, as we had a, a a great discussion earlier this year in Davos, alongside the World Economic Forum, on these issues, where you uh, moderated a panel there as well, talking about technology governance and, and the benefit to the world of creating a digital public good. A digital public good, uh, by that phrase, we mean to create usable. How do you create once for use by many? One of the issues that we're seeing is a, a, a stark problem in the world is that we don't have many global institutions to govern what is increasingly becoming multi-stakeholder technology. Just the past few years, we've seen explode in the world, especially in the tax world. And as we talked about earlier, uh, from we heard from uh, Siri and others on the use of blockchain. Blockchain, by its definition, right, is multi-stakeholder. That uh, it seems almost rare now to develop a technology system for a single user, and we think that trend is only going to increase. What results of that is these governance models become really important. For a couple of reasons that number one, there's full transparency about what is being built and to ensure that this trust and level of participation across multiple stakeholders that have an interest in the technology. Uh, it's a fair decision making process to incorporate all of the unique wants and needs and incentives by those stakeholders. And also that you're, of course, making sure that. The, the right ethical boundaries, data security, and data privacy are all upheld. And I think it's important to Monica because when we look to how do you create digital public goods, by its definition, technology for tax purposes connotes there's at least two sides of that equation you have citizen, taxpayers, and tax administrations. And how do you build technology and public goods that's used by those multiple stakeholders? We don't have many global institutions to govern that. We're hoping that the Prosperity Collaborative could help fill a gap there. And uh, something that I think has been a real barrier to adopting of these systems. And and we'd love to get you know thoughts from you and others on that. That I think it's an important important gap in the world that hopefully we can help fill. So Jeffrey, help us out on this a little bit because this is a, a new concept for a lot of folks. When you are trying to address issues of fraud, when you're trying to address uh, abuses within the tax system, it is often really complex and expensive for governments to build their own solutions from the ground up. Do you believe that there's an opportunity for more collaboration when it comes to the, the creation of these types of solutions? Can we get different jurisdictions feeding ideas uh, into a common pool with the expectation that everyone is going to have to do some customizing. You know, at the end of the day, governments are different, circumstances are different, so you do have to do some optimization to, to meet local needs. But can we have, a, I think, a more cost-effective approach uh, to creating some of the underlying infrastructure that's going to help provide greater accountability in these systems? Yes, definitely. I think that we could we could do that from the standpoint of of basically we're, we're only as strong as wherever that weakest link is, right? And it's something that, that I've approached this, this methodology from my dealings with um, International from the standpoint as we look at money laundering and any other financial crime. Well, if all the, let's say anti-money laundering or the tax rules are not strong based, then the, the bad guy or perpetrator will go and take advantage of wherever underdeveloped country or wherever country that is. But as you talk about the technology that needs to be there and we talk about the public good, I think there's an opportunity to have a base level, um, let's say a, a entry, so to speak, where you have a tax solution that a large, a large, a large country could use, and also an underdeveloped country can use. From the standpoint, it could be it could be a, a web-based 
um, type solution. And then, and then data is basically fed into that for, for tax administration purposes though. But, and then also I think there's a opportunity for a public part, uh, public private partnership where the public sector is working with the private sector to say, all right, what do you need? Um, we, will, we, we will help you to design it. Uh, we will bring in industry experts that worked in um, the tax domain and also that, that understands technology. But so I think that there's an opportunity for the public good um, to have a base level that all countries could utilize. Because until you do that, what happens, and as we all know, that you have the profit shifting, you, you have the people taking advantage of those other, other you know, underdeveloped countries there. But um, if I can just add to, to paying taxes and, and being happy about paying taxes, I, I wanted to, to comment on Siri's um, point there. One of the things that I was thinking of is that I think each taxpayer should have a different experience based on their tax situation, so to speak. And when I say that, I mean that if I go to a, a revenue authority to their website, based on my experience with them, if let's say I file paper and I really they really want me to be electronic, well, maybe my experience is different than a person that hasn't paid when they go to the to the particular website. And, and also I think there's an opportunity to, and, and as an auditor, I really wanted this, is to have the robotic process automation to repeat some of those steps that, so I would not have to do it. Um, and I think, and everybody has to pay, pay their fair share though. That's the thing, that's, that's, that is huge for people to be quote happy. Um, no one's happy if they know that a mega multinational corporation that you know makes a hundred billion dollars is paying zero in taxes or somebody down the street. They wanna make sure that we're all in this together and we're, we're all gonna pay and the, and the rules fit us you know, jointly. Uh, one of my uh, pet aspirations for a while has been uh, that we need to build in rewards to our tax payment system. Uh, so I would love to see, you know, once a year uh, when somebody pays their taxes, they get an overpass named after them. And, you know, we, we have uh, some, some different systems to make it a little bit more exciting to see what's going to happen when you submit that filing, you know, what's going to come out on, on the other side. Uh, these are all ideas we can we can ponder on uh, going forward. Jackie, both Jeffrey and, and Jeff talked a little bit about the opportunities that can exist if we get more jurisdictions working on the same set of challenges. One of the keys to making that happen is standards, and, and Jeff had raised this earlier in the conversation as well. But I'd love to know from your work uh, on these challenges, what you've seen go right around standards, what could go better on standards? Uh, is there work that should be done in that space that isn't being done? Uh, and I ask this in part because it's one of the issues we've been thinking about a lot in the context of the Prosperity Collaborative, and we'd love your advice on whether it's an area we can pursue going forward. So, and, and we can use the current crisis as an example of globalization, cooperation that should exist, and what goes wrong if it doesn't. Um, the pandemic itself has really resonated and really shown us exactly what can go wrong. And so when you think about the standards, this collaboration between public and private means that those who are expert in their field can bring the requisite skills to help collectively solve the problem. And what we've seen, I mean, I'll use the example of data sharing as a, as a prime example here. We're talking about delighting a citizen, but understanding that when you share the data, what can actually go wrong with understanding and exploiting someone's information? And so we do need to in institute standards that say these are the rules of engagement. If we are sharing for, the, for compliance, for fraud, for anti-money laundering, these are the things you can and cannot do relative to the data. How do you anonymize the data? And some of the things that I think we haven't seen, where government really steps up to the plate and says, okay, across, globally across the world, these are the things we need to do to enable the world to operate better as we think about taxes. And again, you know, this positive and negative view of taxes Let's not forget, this is about providing services for a society, for a global world. 
And if we use it in the right way, we will get the right outcomes. Well, and you, I think, make a fascinating and critical point by situating this in the context of the pandemic, because what we are seeing at you know, the most painful level imaginable, both in terms of the uh, cost and uh, the, the financial fallout, but you know, more critically, the cost in lives, uh, is a failure of investment in, in global public goods. We didn't do a good job building the infrastructure that we needed to uh, over the last few decades to respond to something like this. And so right now we are paying an almost incalculable price as a result of that failure uh, to invest and, and create the resource base necessary uh, to solve this set of challenges. Can I, can so, I add please. to that? In one, and when you think about the, the role of the tax authority, the data that the tax authority has can provide insight in terms of the economic levers that we need to, to use, policies that need to be made to help the economy restart, reboost. Those, those are things that no other authority can do. And so why, why are we not using that? And why are government authorities not collaborating together to look at that in a way for good? And I think, you know, Jeff's point about this digital, this social good is pivotal in this new world. After the session that Jeff and I did uh, in Davos, uh, Siri, I was talking with the CEO of one of the technical partners that's working with you on, on your work in um, Cambodia, uh, and they're helping on, on the blockchain side of the equation to stand up your digital payment system. Digital payments are obviously one crucial element of infrastructure that can be helpful uh, in creating a more accountable, uh, fair taxation re uh, regime. Are there other pieces of digital infrastructure that you would highlight? Again, coming at this as somebody uh, from a global South country that is digitizing quite rapidly, that would be helpful in your work. Are there things that, you know, to, to Jackie's point, we should be mobilizing around uh, to get more countries, more governments uh, building solutions that can have broad application across many different uh, jurisdictions? Uh, just now, um, you were mentioning about comfortability and tax uh, in the same sentence, and then um, Jackie was also mentioning about you know how much data sharing is important. Um, I mean, particularly in this pandemic time, you see a lot of people are cash trapped, right? Um, they're they're not able to to access proper financing during this period. And, 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 and this is really, uh, I mean, bad for the, for the economy. Um, one way we could do this sharing, I mean, tax and comfort, if, if you're paying your tax on time, this information should also help you into your credit scoring, for instance, to be able to better access um, financing from bank. Um, how you pay your tax, et cetera, should, I mean, there, there is so many things that we can use from the data that we collect from tax payment to help businesses and individuals properly access to finance and vice versa. Um, so this is something I, I, I can see that um, th there needs a collaboration between all, all, all stakeholders uh, within the government at least, um, and possibly others, but at least within the government um, to make that happen. That is a, a great uh, point to make and a couple of housekeeping notes as we are nearing the end of our time. Uh, the first is we want to thank all those that have submitted questions online. Uh, we have a, a number still coming in. We're gonna try to get to as many as we can. All of the questions that are submitted online to digi at newamerica.org or via Twitter using the hashtag uh, Prosperity Collaborative will be fed into the process uh, that we use to do our after action write up. Uh, and that will be shared on, on our blog and others. Uh, so we encourage you to please send in your thoughts, send in your comments. Uh, we will get those to the right folks. Uh, second, uh, as, as part of our last round of, of questions, I want to ask all of you, uh, you know, by the power vested in me for purposes of this conversation, uh, I'm going to designate each of you uh, the respective kings and queens of global taxation for the day. Uh, and 
I want to ask you what you would do with that power. What are the systems you would create? What are the solutions uh, you would implement? We've been encouraged in the conversations that we've started having with an array of multilateral organizations, be it the Open Government Partnership or the Community of Democracies, that are starting to take a real uh, interest in these issues. And there seems to be an opportunity to work in this space uh, in part because a lot of the red tape that has historically precluded quick action uh, is being cast aside in the context of the crisis. Uh, but what are the things that you would do if you had the ability to reshape this ecosystem uh, for a day? And, and Jeff, I'm gonna start with you. Excellent. Thank you, Tamika. This has come up a couple of times on the panel. I think one of the, one of the the really uh, intriguing pr problems that exist in the world is the intergovernmental issue. And we touched on a little bit earlier, this lack of a, a global governance model. And just by way of example, you look at organizations like the World Trade Organization or, or WCO, where in the global trade dimension, you have uh, strong global governance models. And as results, there's greater harmony across jurisdictions. There's model laws that are adopted by others. and and when we look to the promise of innovative technology, we don't have those those um, those global governance models. So, uh, to answer your question, King for a day, I would create that global institution first. I think it begins at the institution level before the bits and bytes of any particular technology. We need global governance. We need some uh, existing governing board to step up and say we're going to create standards and principles for AI. Um, uh, prediction models for tax or data usage. We don't have that yet, and I think it's holding us back. Jeffrey. Okay. Yes. If I was um, king for a day in the, in the tax tax for a while, I think I would have a um, a system where there was a a um, uh, definitely needs some digital transformation, but there was a an open platform to for countries to communicate and actually share the data. So the infrastructure definitely. Um, needs to be in place where you can see the, the 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 life cycle from data to discovery to deployment and actually take some measurable results from that. But but also but ultimately though, um, the tax policy though, an exchange of information between governments and tax treaties that also has to be changed because you can't do one without the other. Um, the automatic exchange of information. I know there are challenges there, even as we look at um, FATCA when that was rolled out in the United States and um, the common reporting standards in the EU. Just making sure that it, it works together, but there has to be policy changes or it, there has to be policy changes first to, to, to embed it, to, to look at the end game as you're making policy decisions, how is this information going to be used down the road um, with the, all the countries that are involved? Fantastic. Jackie, your thoughts on this? Queen for a day. Queen for a day. I, you know, Jeff really stole my idea, but the, the basis for that for me would be Davos. Nowhere else do I have all these great leaders where I can hold them to account, create a charter, and give actions. And so my queen for a day is the next time in Davos, I would like to stand up there and hold all these leaders to account in terms of digital for good. What are we going to do to change the world in the next five years? Well, uh, for better or worse, we have a long history of engagement at Davos on these issues. Uh, uh, Jeff, we're, we're going to have to conspire with Jackie on that uh, because uh, we are yeah. Earlier this week, actually, um, or at the end of last week, we announced the Presidio Principles uh, in partnership with our friends at the World Economic Forum, uh, which address a number of key questions around data and data privacy and uh, citizen and consumer ownership of data uh, that uh, are really core to some of the questions we've uh, explored today. Uh, and I, I love the idea of doing something similar when it comes to tax and public revenue. I, th I think that's a brilliant idea. Um, so we we have our our homework for this uh, conversation. Uh, Siri, Queen for a day. For a day, I I would do everything the rest of the panelists mentioned. Um, but in addition, so digitization is very important. But in addition to that, I wish there is a way that could be could 
I mean, as, as a taxpayer, um, I want to see where my money is going to. And, and that is, we, we haven't really touched on that. We're talking about how we better collect tax, but we've never talked about, you know, how do we um, show to the, to the taxpayer what has been done with their money? Um, and I, I think that that is very important. If you want people to pay their due, you have to tell them what they're doing with that. Let me, that's fantastic. We have a f very few more minutes and, and Jackie, I'm going to ask you for your help in squeezing in an answer to one more question. We have such wonderful questions that have come in. This one's from Shafiq Barbar at MIT, uh, and I think it's going to be relevant for a whole lot of people listening and, and makes for a, a good point, a good place to conclude our conversation. Uh, and Shafiq asks, how do we get other partners and, and specifically innovative startups, those that may not have the infrastructure of an EY or a Microsoft to work with government engaged in this space? Because there is a perception, rightly or wrongly, but too often I fear it's correct, uh, that it's not easy dealing with government on these issues. It's not easy to create solutions and innovative technologies uh, that can resolve these challenges. You've seen this play out on both sides. What's your advice to those that want to help create solutions, uh, but are feeling a little bit daunted by the prospect of working with the public sector? Yeah, I, I think that's a really excellent point. And I think there are two things that one, we need to do a better job of, but two, also these start startups and small businesses can really hold us to account in terms of that. Um, the partnerships that government has with large scale technology organizations such as ourselves, as Microsoft, hinges on the ability to include people from the entire ecosystem. And so, so there's two things here. There's one, policy needs to be instituted in government to ensure that everyone can play, whether it be large corporation or small corporations. Technology firms such as Microsoft are utilizing small startups and other businesses to become part of these consortia. And you should start to see, you, you, will, you see that where it plays everywhere. Um, I think one of the things we could do a better job of is really demanding at the table when government is really thinking about launching a new program, a new service, do we have enough of people in the ecosystem, large and small, to be able to do that? And I think both large corporations and the public should be requiring this to say that everyone can play. That would, that would be my, my, my recommendation. Fantastic. Well, on that note, let me thank our extraordinary panelists, Siri, Jackie, Jeffrey, and, and Jeff. You guys give tax a good name. Uh, it's been a pleasure thinking with you today. Uh, let me emphasize that this is the beginning, not the end of a longer conversation on these issues. Uh, the Prosperity Collaborative is excited to engage not only with the panelists here today, uh, but also with those of you participating virtually as we work to address these challenges going forward. Uh, and the timing could not be more crucial. This conversation will be made available as a recording following conclusion of this session. Uh, we hope that uh, those of you who are watching will share it. Uh, again, continue to send us comments. They will feed into our work on these issues. Uh, and our thanks to our amazing partners uh, at the World Bank, MIT, uh, and uh, the Boston Global Forum for helping us to uh, create this uh, incredible platform along with EY uh, to address these challenges. Uh, Chair, I'll hand things back to you, uh, and uh, we appreciate uh, your help in orchestrating our conversation today. And uh, I want to thank this uh, everybody. This has been a, a very exciting uh, seminar today, extremely informative, I think also energizing. There is a lot of work to do. And I think the prosperity, the collaborative prosperity is a great platform to continue this work together. And um, we're also looking forward to a series of these events. I think we want to expand in this direction. And uh, so I hope, I look forward to the next appointment and uh, thank everybody for the participation and for the insights and also for spending time with us in such a difficult moment. Um, and um, I wish you a good day. Thank you.